a new era of socialism with Chinese characteristics. This new area will be an area of building on past successes to further advance our cause and of continuing in a new historical context to strive for the success of socialism with Chinese characteristics. Stressing the importance and efficacy of party building, General Secretary Xi Jinping also vowed to step up efforts to combat corruption. What are the major challenges ahead? The cage of institutions that prevents corruption has been strengthened, and moral defenses against corruption are in the making. The anti-corruption campaign has built into a crushing tide, is being consolidated and continues to develop. A number of judicial reforms have been carried out during the past five years, and after the National Congress, the CPC will continue to advance law-based governance in all areas. What does this policy mean for the government, the society, and the country? New leaders of the CPC, the world's biggest political party, have taken the stage. We will work diligently to meet our duty, fulfill our mission, and be worthy of their trust. What can we expect from the new leadership, and how will they achieve the new era goal of building a great modern socialist country by the middle of this century? On Tuesday, the Communist Party of China's newly elected top leadership, headed by General Secretary Xi Jinping, visited the party's birthplace in Shanghai and Jiaxing, Zhejiang Province. During the trip, Xi Jinping reminded all party members to remain true to their original aspirations and wholeheartedly serve the people. To discuss the challenges facing the CPC as it seeks to implement ambitious plans for the future of China, I'm happy to be joined in the studio by Dr. Su Ge, President of China Institute of International Studies, Anna Tangen, author and columnist, and uh, Gautam Makunda, is distinguished visiting professor from uh, Schwarzman College at Tsinghua University. That's our topic. This is a Dialogue. I'm Yang Rui. Well, as I said earlier in the opening remarks, uh, Mr. Xi Jinping had the uh, new team of the Politburo Standing Committee and paid a tribute to the birthplace of the Communist Party, the largest uh, political party in the world, with a number of uh, almost 90 million out of 1.3 billion. So what do you think of the message that uh, Mr. Xi Jinping tried to deliver through this symbolic gesture? Very good starting uh, point. Uh, as a general practice, the newly elected uh, leadership, uh, that means the core of the Politburo members, will go and visit uh, one of the uh, very sacred places which has a lot to do with the birth of the party, with the growth of the party and the development of the revolutionary course, so to speak. This time, why uh, they, they went to two places? Actually, it's a two in one, because of the first uh, uh, National Congress of the Communist Party of China was held in 1921 in Shanghai in the French quarters. However, during the process of the meeting, they discerned some interference from the, 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 the French uh, legation police. And then they had to shift to Nanhu, uh, Nanhu Lake and they continued their meeting on the, on the, the well now it's called the Red Boat. Uh, I think the message is that, uh, as uh, manifested by the 19th Party Congress, the newly elected party leadership wants to adhere to the original aspiration of the party, that is to serve the people domestically and also make contribution to the world. Yeah, we see five big characters inside the Gate of Zhongnan Hai, yeah. headquarters of the CDC Central Committee, Wei Renmin Fu, right? Yeah. If so you travel along the Chan Boulevard, yeah. um, the gold plated five characters, Wei Renmin Fu, serving people. So that remains the motto and principal uh, aspirations for the biggest ruling party in the world, Anna. Four years from now, the Communist Party of China will commemorate the centennial uh, uh, day. Um, and that will be a landmark event for this uh, part. What do you think of uh, Xi Jinping's uh, ambition and his blueprint? 
Well, I, I think he's uh, taken the aspirational part of what Mao was doing, who was very much about ideology and the uh, pragmatism that Deng espoused. And he's trying to find a middle way that reconciles them. I mean, I think he feels in the last five years he was able to reconcile socialism with markets. And I think in the next uh, four to five years, he's looking to uh, reconcile uh, Marxis Marxism with traditional Chinese values. So I think it's very important, these, these uh, visits to these kind of places where the party began, because the greater, the greater amount of change that you're trying to bring about, the more it is necessary to say, but this is all part of a continuity. You fail to ask me a question about oh, yes, history. Yes, actually, you know, you are <laughs> in history because you were there when uh, Hu Jintao made his visit to exactly. his... Exactly. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry for leaving aside for the moment, but I did visit the yeah. Xibai mm -hmm. It's the location where the headquarters of the, the PLA uh, military and the leadership of Mao Zedong and his team engineered the huge success of the three military campaigns that the community with the takeover of power and the founding of the PRC in 1949. And surprisingly, uh, that's not the first trip for me and my team to visit Xi Bai Po, mm -hmm. where Hu Jintao paid the tribute to uh, the um, Roots iconic the leadership mm -hmm. of the Communist Party when he first took office. Mm -hmm. uh, my previous trip ahead of this one was actually my coverage on a very interesting project it was initiated by three lawmakers in the DC and all of them were pro-Taiwan. When they were watching Hu Jintao, what he did right after taking office, they were amazed by this trip, this tribute that Xi Jin, uh, Hu Jintao paid to Xi Bai Po. Then they gave uh, a senior diplomat in the Chinese embassy a call asking for why. This Chinese diplomat said to me in the interview, because Xi Bai Po is a very symbolic uh, uh, um, uh, what would you call that? A divine place or a, a cradle a, a of the revolution? Sacred, sacred, sacred place. Sacred place. Sacred place for the Communist Party. So, the three lawmakers in the DC said, let's do something in this uh, very unique place. They traveled to Xibai Po, they decided to set up a computer lab hmm. for the, the primary street. school, for the, primary, for the pupils of the primary school. They say, if Xibai Po played such a vital and a unique role in the uh, Chinese revolution. Then let's uh, foresee the next revolution and uh, the impact of computer or the internet. So they decided to set up the computer lab to enlighten the Is that the only students. revolution they were interested in? <laughs> <laughs> well, what inspirations can you draw from the uh, move by the three lawmakers uh, of the DC? So it's a striking set idea that American lawmakers, even who are ones who are pro-Taiwan, decide to build relations with China by building institutions that train Chinese, the sort of the future of China, Chinese students, in these information technologies that have enabled the relationship between China and the United States, but also helped to so done so much to enable China's rise. That's yes. that symbolism of Americans saying we want you to partake in these technologies that we invented, but that you can benefit from every bit as much is a powerful one and one that I think we should be, you know, we should look forward to it hopeful. hopefully. The, what we've seen in the last few years is that the rise of China was good for China and in many ways good for the world, but it had some pretty, pretty large consequences inside the United States. Not all of them were positive. And trying to think through what that means for the world and how we're going to handle that will be the major question for the next 10 years, I suspect. So, so what mm. we have said today... He, he said not positive. Not all of them are positive. <laughs> what, what, like what? So we have good political science research that shows that parts of the country that were most affected by, Chinese, by sort of Chinese industrialization, where job loss was highest, things like mm -hmm. that, have both suffered to a really great extent in a variety of ways, larger, larger sort of the opiates epidemic, things like that. Um, they tended to vote for Donald Trump. And so that's not to say that in the aggregate, the relationship has been very positive for both sides. Yeah. It, but it is also to say that in the aggregate, it doesn't affect everybody. Yeah, but, the the the, the, but the problem with that is that the majority of the profits that went from 2001 to now have been going back to the United States, although the amount of manufacturing is done. The people who moved here and the corporations moved here were our corporations. Hey, come on. So, so, corporations. so that's not, yeah. I'm not, uh, not I, I know, I, gentlemen, you are, yeah. you are American. I know, I, I don't <laughs> argue with <laughs> Americans about the bilateral relationship, the most consequential one in the 21st 
21st century. Let me bring you guys back to the issue of confidence. Now, Mr. Xi Jinping uh, said over and over in many of his policy speeches that we should do whatever we can to foster our confidence in the path, the theory, system, and the culture of socialism with Chinese characteristics. In fact, the catchphrase yeah. in the vocabulary about the 19th National Congress of CBC is and there will be new era yeah. that he has embarked on uh, on socialism with Chinese characteristics. So let's take a closer look at the issue of confidence. Why do you think he came across as a very confident uh, uh, in the opening ceremony of the 19th uh, National Congress of the CPC. Uh, and uh, Western media will tend to use assertiveness to characterize uh, the growing influence of the Chinese. But Chinese say that we uh, have a we, we, we continue to have growing confidence. You're right, uh, there are some catchphrases in the uh, National uh, Party Congress, the 1990 uh, Party Congress, like the New Era. Uh, Xi Jinping thought mm -hmm. and the uh, Xi Jinping thought should be in plural form. Xi Jinping thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Xi Jinping thought on uh, building uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics in a new era. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the new guiding uh, principle, guiding uh, uh, thought, ideology for, uh, for China in the next uh, uh, decades. The reason why we say so is that um, now this time unlike some of the past conferences which would set agenda for the next five years. But this time, it sets agenda for the next 30 years and more. Because in the first stage, President Xi Jinping in his party Congress report saying that from now to 2020, we're going to go through a preparatory stage. And by then, and, the, uh, and the, then the GDP uh, per capita will reach uh, 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 12,000 US dollars per, uh, per person. Then, from then on, there will be two stages from 2020 to 2035. Then, 15 years. 15 years. Two 15 years. Two 15 way. years. And then, that's the uh, period in which China would, I could reach, uh, would reach this uh, uh, moderately, moder uh, um, reach uh, moderate. Uh, modestly uh, prosperous, prosperous uh, modestly stage. prosperous stage, and uh, then reach the Chinese modernization, and by then, by then another 15 years from 2035 to 2050, uh, uh, because the first one would be the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party centenary uh, commemoration. The second is uh, by 2049, the People's Republics will, uh, will be 100 years old. And by 2050, and then Xi Jinping and is confident the Chinese Communist Party is going to lead the republic into a prosperous, into a strong and and a beautiful and uh, with uh, social progress into one uh, which would be one of the countries well, that has uh, we were talking about that if China would be able to usher in a golden era at the cost of the U.S. global decline during at least the presidency of Donald mm -hmm. Trump. Is that the discourse that the Americans have been pretty concerned about? Uh, uh, so I think Americans are pretty concerned, at least ones who aren't part of the Trump administration, that the Trump administration seems to be pretty dedicated to giving up American global leadership. Mm -hmm. The amount of damage that they can do in three years is large but limited. At the end of the, at the, end of the Trump administration, which presumably will be only three years away, um, the United States will still be the largest economy in the world. Even, mm -hmm. even Donald Trump probably can't screw that up. But uh, the relationship will certainly more, be more equal. I just flip this on the side that maintaining a stable global system has benefits, but it also has costs. Mm -hmm. If the United mm -hmm. States is no longer willing to pay those costs, China, either China has to pay them or the system will no longer remain open. It is not clear that China has decided that it wants to pay that, and they are not trivial. Oh, well, we made that very clear, very clear, uh, when Xi Jinping uh, delivered the policy speech in Davos uh, to support globalization and the free trade and so, free investment. So, so speech, speeches are not actions. The Xi Jinping speech was a beautiful speech about the virtues no, let of me globalization. Quote, uh, let me quote President Bush senior as saying, read my lips, yeah. right? So is that what uh, Xi Jinping wanted to say to the audience in Davos? I mean, uh, Anna, what do you think of uh, the uh, Chinese leadership, are we ready from your observation? Are you uh, ready? No, I think this is a little bit more, um, it was brought on principally by the uh, vacuum created by Donald Trump. 
Now, in terms of ability to do this, uh, China has shown that its, its ability to plan is par none in the world. And I don't think anyone here would uh, uh, disagree with that. China has prospered because it sits down, examines everything, and then comes up with a plan, and it sticks to it. It doesn't have the vagaries of uh, you know, the positives and negatives of democracy, one of which is that you have one side advocating one thing and then they switch mm -hmm. out and somebody undoes everything that the last guy tried to do. So I, I think China is capable of doing it. I think this was probably a little bit ahead of the game plan, uh, even for China, and that it was a surprise. But it's just what it is, and I think uh, she has, I think he's put forward a very c compelling case internally and I would agree partially with you that he has to convince the rest of the world and a lot of that. I think Belt and Road will actually be the one because it's non-political, it represents a new paradigm in how international relations, and it's very pragmatic. It's going to connect up communities that have been bypassed and creating, hopefully, markets for China, but also uh, places where you can get research. Yeah, China well, observe, research. Chinese and the foreign alike uh, agree that uh, the Belt and Road Initiative that could be described as a smart Xi Jinping doctrine in navigating our own course uh, in the years ahead. Having said this, uh, China has long played the second fiddle in international politics. Today, during the process of a dynamic geopolitical reconfiguration, China has never before, has never been so close to the center stage. Mm -hmm. Let me quote Xi Jinping as saying or has never been so close to uh, the realization of a national rejuvenation. He used these two phrases to characterize China's ascending to the center stage yeah. as uh, uh, never before. Uh, so is there such a discourse about uh, Thucydides' tribe? Mm. There must be a clash between the rising power and the existing power. Be look at the uh, team of uh, Donald Trump. Uh, Navarra, uh, Steve Bannon, now one after another they have been left marginalized but it doesn't mean that the former or ex-generals that still occupy center stage of the presidency of Trump will not exert any serious influence on his decision makings. Having yeah. said this, what do you think of this uh, trap? Yeah, Could uh, speaking of the traps, there are several traps and as uh, in the eyes of President Xi Jinping at least he sees two major traps ahead of him and ahead of, of China. The first one is domestic because we have to keep minds of both domestic uh, situation and international. And anything, uh, uh, any domestic policy is a basis and, 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 and foreign policy is an extension of a domestic policies. So Xi Jinping said that domestically, job number one, we need not to fall into the middle income trap. And some of the countries, they have not uh, fared uh, well. Uh, so Xi Jinping lays he heavy emphasis on uh, po policy, uh, I mean poverty elevation, mm -hmm. on the clean partnership, anti-corruption, and, uh, and, and then on the con continuing uh, continuation on domestic economic construction, on betterment of society and social uh, life, and so on. Internationally, he sees the convergence of national interests between the existing I mean, status quo power United States and this rising power China. He sees that he said we have 1,000 reasons to expect a good cooperative relationship between China mm -hmm. and we need not to fall into this uh, so-called uh, Thucydides trap. So uh, uh, my personal feeling is that uh, uh, President Trump is on, uh, he's, uh, on the way uh, to China for a state visit uh, and China is ready to extend the friendship and uh, this time we, we, we uh, hope and we believe that uh, uh, these two heads of the states uh, they will enter into a um, uh, dialogue which uh, will show the uh, good direction of these two countries uh, which uh, would be beneficial not only to the bilateral relations but to the region and to the world for more peace, stability and development. Now with the rise of populism Policymakers and uh, uh, s political scientists start to talk about the alleged retreat of a new liberalism. Mm. Uh, that put the discourse of uh, Francisco uh, uh, Fukuyama on, you know, what he said in the, uh, the, in the book, history, The Last Man and the End of History, into danger, into a serious uh, discussion. He's been backing away from that statement ever since he made it. <laughs> <laughs> it's also completely misunderstood. No, are we living? So, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the point of my next question, gentlemen, is uh, 
do you think we live in an age of post-truth, uh, alternative truth, uh, fake news? Uh, I mean, um, since so many people are talk, like uh, Mears Hamill, the American professor who talks smart about uh, inevitable clashes uh, between the United States and China, do you think these are uh, self-fulfilling prophecy? Do you think this is, uh, this is a fake news? This is a, yeah. uh, I mean, if everybody thinks the clash is inevitable, it is in fact inevitable. But there's nothing in history or political science that says that it has to be. Power transitions, if that is what we're seeing, and that's not at all clear. Um, can be handled quite peacefully. Look at the one between Great Britain and the United States, which mm -hmm. was essentially seamless. But they are democracies, right? They are. In the Western sense. And, 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 they're, and they're culturally similar and they speak the same language. Um, I, so before the Trump administration, I would have said that the great danger was Chinese overconfidence. Mm -hmm. uh, with, with the advent of the Trump administration, I would say that the great danger is American recklessness. Um, but it is the, you, should, right, you should hope that it's the American generals who have a large voice in the Trump administration, because American generals are the ones who are most likely to say, we don't want any part of the f fight. We, not, we need to talk. It's Jim Mattis who famously said, if you don't, if you don't hire diplomats, buy me more bullets. Mm -hmm. I'd rather you hire diplomats. Mm -hmm. The generals are the ones who are keeping the situation stable. Mm -hmm. not oh, the, the generals of the United States <coughs> even threatened to launch a preemptive nuclear warfare against the former Soviet Union in 1962, to the horror and dismay of the first lady who saw the shelter in the bunker <laughs> at the well, defining moment of the Cuban <laughs> missile crisis. Curtis LeMay was very different from Jim Mattis. Yeah. Um, <laughs> those are radically different personalities. Yeah. Yeah. JFK had a different reality. But I, I'm going to disagree with both my learned colleagues on this point. I don't think that uh, this idea that it's U.S. and China head-to-head -head is correct. I think it's a multipolar world and that it is destructive to continue to believe that the other voices around the table, Russia, Europe, uh, that the rest of the BRICS, the um, emerging and developing nations should be ignored in some sort of uh, <laughs> creation of a, of, a, of a pact between these two yeah. superpowers. That is, it's not possible anymore. The, the, the percentage of GDP that both of them represent together are, is overwhelming, but apart from that, they need trade partners. China has 160 trade partners, which it's number one tr trading uh, status with. Yeah. This is necessary to its development. This is why I think the Belt and Road and this kind of multipolar uh, development is much, should be the emphasis instead of saying that this is between two rising powers. Um, a power politics aside, uh, there is a quiet consensus, uh, which itself is a, a will remain controversial for Chinese observers here. Uh, the biggest danger and the most devastating crisis might come, free, might come from within instead of from without. Mm -hmm. You look at uh, the issue of uh, overconfidence, uh, or in other words, the Chinese assertiveness in the Chinese uh, in the South China Sea. What do you think of this allegation? Um, no, the middle income trap is one thing economically, yeah. but what about, uh, for example, uh, the sustainable campaign that should be institutionalized to fight corruption? Yeah. And mm -hmm. Mr. Dollarji, who heads the anti graft campaign after mm -hmm. Wang Qishan, uh, vowed to uh, uh, not to get relaxed. It's not the time to sit back complacently. We must continue the fight against uh, corruption to uh, let those guys know that you dare not uh, risk. Uh, your, your political career mm. in uh, uh, receiving bribes. Uh, you should not think even, you should not even think of this idea of getting corrupt because you'll pay a heavy price. Uh, well, the, when you think of this uh, global governance and the, how different the political parties run their state affairs, I think today's uh, perceptions are somewhat affected by uh, the ideolo ideologies arose from the from the during the Cold War. For instance, during the West, in the West, when you think of the Chinese Communist Party, that's well, it's a Communist Party. So when the certain people in in China, when you view the West, they think, well, it's a bourgeois ideology, the capitalist system. So, so naturally, you, you think of these two systems as uh, antagonistic towards each other. However, but if you take a closer look at the system, you might see that uh, the generally normally perceived uh, Chinese socialism is, uh, is somewhat different from uh, what from is Stalinism. Good. Yeah, which is associated with the, yeah, the from purge, the Soviet the model. Gulag. Because the Chinese is very, very nowadays different. when you say socialism with the Chinese characteristics, it's very different, quite different from the Soviet earlier so Soviet model. Because they are th they are paying attention, they have focus on the planning side now. 
the market reform has been incorporated into the party constitution. So that being said, I think that the Chinese uh, uh, Communist Party, although they have the uh, aspirations of ideology, but they are very down to earth, they are practical. Down from, from Deng Xiaoping's time, the uh, white and black cats, uh, the theory, uh, now to, uh, to, to the new era, to the uh, new uh, guiding principles, uh, you can see that the practicum is really at work. Yeah, uh, Xi Jinping and his comrades just said over and over, we would keep our door open, we would deepen the reform comprehensively yeah. to lay groundwork for uh, the uh, modest uh, prosperity of the whole society by the year uh, 2030, uh, to lift each and every Chinese national out of poverty mm -hmm. in a campaign that has never been seen before in our human history. So what, what do you think of... Uh, uh, challenges, multiple challenges are arising from within and, uh, and the silver linings that we might uh, actually... Well, we might uh, actually the anti-corruption drive is what I see as the most important part. If the party cannot justify its, its position and the goals that it's, it says it's going to achieve and be accountable for them, mm -hmm. it all falls apart. And part of that is, uh, right now we've seen that there's political will to take out uh, the big guys, uh, the tigers. But the truth is, if you're living in a village or a city, the, the person who is most annoying to you, who, who affects you every day, is the local party leader who is not doing their job, whether it's by graft or just hey, incompetence, whatever. We will say uh, Xi Jinping, during the first five years of his administration, took out uh, big shots. Uh, he used the phrase of, uh, let's solve the problems above the neck, mm. right? Yeah. Now it's time to pick fight against the flies, not just tigers, yes. the flies. But so that goes to my, answering my question. Then Without what about fighting the flies, you, will not, you, you could have potentially big problems mm -hmm. down the line. What about uh, the alleged uh, inactivities, uh, low morale of the local government officials? Uh, now, people say uh, Mr. Xi Jinping will send out uh, uh, more review inspection teams yeah. uh, to let the local government officials know, if you gave me the poor uh, record, uh, of your office of performance, you'll be demoted, you'll be dismissed, well, you'll be sent behind, you'll be thrown behind the bars, perhaps on charges of corruption. So this is a very meaningful. I mean, this could be a very stern warning for those who want to sit back in this, uh, as onlooker instead of uh, being an uh, active participant in the process I, I agree. of modernization. I, accountability is absolutely key, and you cannot have people in and say, I, I'm, I don't want to do anything because I don't, you know, don't want to risk being singled out. Yeah. But the, there are also opposite parts to that, in the sense that there's, uh, there's a lot of concentration of power. There's going to be issues about how you transfer this. Uh, in the future, and this is one of the issues that he also has to do. It's not just purifying the party and making sure that people want to serve the people, but then at some now, point he has gentlemen, to Now, gentlemen, perhaps we don't have enough time to discuss yet another major issue concerning the one-party system that China has been so proud. We've been talking about the issue of confidence, and that has a lot to do with uh, the one-party system, which has been so increasingly adaptable to the uh, changing times. Uh, having said this, uh, um, what, what do you think of uh, uh, the uh, resilience uh, of, this, uh, of the political institutions in, in China compared with uh, the multi-party uh, competitive democracy? Well, compared with the United States, the timelines are completely different. The United States uh, government lab goes back to 1789 in its current form. Uh, what I would note is that one party, one person states, ones that are personalized around a single person, do not have a good historical record, even when the one person is really impressive, if nothing else because that person ages and age has effects on all of us. Um, no country in history has ever moved as far as fast as China has in the last generation. So history does not provide us the, all that many guides because there aren't historical precedents for it. But planning and detailed planning and keeping to the plan are really useful as long as things go according to the plan. When they don't, then you can run into problems, and that's what we haven't seen yet. Perhaps a brief review of the history. We uh, all agree that the history provides more questions than answers or solutions. But China is ambitious to provide the Chinese solution. We keep our fingers crossed for the success of China and the cool prosperity through Belt and Road Initiative. Thank you very much for being part of this edition of Dialogue. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.